Well, thank you very much for joining us here today. Well, I find Lab to App a wonderful title because it contains a story. It contains maybe many stories. It allows us to tell stories. I would like to tell you one of these stories. It's the story of a journey. It's a long journey. And as we know, the famous Chinese wise philosopher Lao Tzu said, a journey of a thousand miles always starts with a single step. But actually, as we know, he should have said with a single atom. And here is a slide which relates to that, because when I was giving this part of this talk in front of the Chinese Minister for Science, I had to remove this slide. Otherwise, I would have ended up immediately in prison after delivering my talk. <laughs> and you will see immediately why, why that is, because this is a story which starts 20 years ago, when, well, I, co I was coming out of the lab with my bike, I wanted to bike home, and in comes a black limousine. I was in Innsbruck, in the lab of my colleague Rainer Blatt, whom you see on this picture, and out of the limousine comes the Dalai Lama, who is pictured here. Well, the point was that His Holiness had been taught in school something which probably you have been taught, and I have been taught, and even my children, as I hear, are being taught nowadays, which is that you cannot see a single atom. That maybe you can use these scanning microscopes, these fancy things, but really optically, with your eye, you are not going to see a single atom, right? So then, in the lab of my colleague Rainer Blatt, there is a vacuum chamber. In this vacuum chamber, there is an ion trap. Ions are laden, uh, laden atoms, and then, you know, charged atoms, and then what you have is you put your eye on the eyepiece, and between your eye and the single atom, which is trapped there, there is only glass. You wait for five minutes, you wait in the, in the darkness, your eye get ac gets accustomed to the darkness, and then there you will see it there. The single atom, very tiny, greenish, you know, a little bit lost and forgotten, lonely down there, but you do see it. And this, I can tell you, is something which is hard to believe. And it is something which, you know, has many implications. His Holiness wanted to experience it because it comes to wonder, together with wonder, something which you experience in the lab when you want to do, to discover things. You are curiosi curiosity driven. But then, this is also the foundation of the next quantum revolution. And this is what I am going to tell a little bit in the following. And why does it, this imply a new revolution? Well, if we think of information processing, here is a picture of the first transistor. It is something which is much bigger than the sculptures that we have seen before. Much, much bigger, you know, millimeters. It was, you know, some 70 years ago. And now what happens is that we carry in our pockets many, many billions, as it has been already said, of those devices. This would not be possible without quantum mechanics. So this was the first quantum revolution, you know, when people using some of the equations which are here on this board and controlling individual quanta, individual atoms, photons, electrons, well, this brings with itself new laws. And then people learned how to engineer, to bring from the lab, outside of the lab, those laws of physics, and do devices. And this talk would not be delivered today without quantum mechanics, because only with quantum mechanics, by mastering its laws, we can realize all the information processing devices that we have nowadays. And of course, as we know, the power, computing power, grows and grows. This is known as Moore's law. The idea that the density of devices on a chip would double every few years. And this, when Moore, Gordon Moore, founder of, of um, Intel many, many years ago, predicted, well, this was something which he thought maybe will last for a few years. And then it lasted for many, many years, and it kept on growing, and it is no longer the case. So Moore's law is now broken, in the sense that you are not going to see this doubling of devices on chips. And what is the reason? Because if you make more devices on a chip, you have to make them smaller and smaller and smaller, and they become now comparable to the size of single atoms. And so, it doesn't work anymore, because digital information processing is based on bits. It's zeros and ones. But if you go to the level of single atoms, then, well, you no longer have just a zero and one. You have other things, something which Einstein uh, defined as spooky. 
spooky because he said, I mean, this is not possible that we have such connections between distant uh, uh, objects such as in entanglement. So here is a picture which I stole from a colleague who is Nobel laureate for physics, Bill Phillips. The first picture, the, the one above, shows you that what is superposition. You have something, you have you know, a cube which is depicted there, and at the same time it has its face up and face down. And when you look at it, well, either you will see face up or face down, you are never going to see this uh, both at the same time. And even more evidently, if you have two such uh, um, cubes, you look at them, see them collapse one downwards and the other upwards. You will see always them either both on the same direction downwards or upwards. This is just a metaphor, of course. It does not explain quantum mechanics. But if you do experiments with quantum objects, this is what happens. You have an undefined state, it's in a superposition, it's both at the same time, but then when you look at them, they are correlated. So this is a correlation which Einstein considered, Einstein considered quantum mechanics wrong because of this. He thought it's impossible, we must have a better theory. Actually, he was wrong, quantum mechanics uh, really describes reality, you can make experiments, you can make teleportation, for instance, with these things, I will show that. Actually, it's much better than Star Trek, I will explain that. But <coughs> what can you do? when you have such uh, superpositions of many atoms. Well, one thing you can do is with these atoms, you do, instead of bits, you do quantum bits. So, devices which can be in different possible states at the same time. It means that I am able, if I can manipulate that, to really process all possible inputs of a certain problem in parallel with a quantum processing machine. And this seems a kind of a fantasy. And actually, when I started teaching my course in Ulm 10 years ago, I said to the students, yeah, this is, well, yeah, let's do this. It's fun, but mm, who knows? <laughs> and actually, this one here is a picture from the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas from last year, 2018, in which Intel presented their chips with 9, 17, 49 qubits. Okay, quantum bits. And then, in the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas this year, IBM presented the first commercial quantum computer. And Madame Merkel was in Davos last January, and she spoke with Mrs. Rometti, the CEO of IBM, and decided to purchase one for Germany. And this happened a few weeks ago. And this is still, you know, with a few tens of qubits, but actually three days ago, uh, my week was ruined by Google, because <laughs> Google did something which is really amazing, uh, which is really a, a technological masterpiece. They created a quantum computer with 53 working quantum bits, which realized quantum suprem what they call quantum supremacy, which is it calculated something in 200 seconds, which the fastest supercomputer on Earth would take 10,000 years to calculate. So it is no longer science fiction. And my week was ruined because I could not do anything because the whole press was calling, you know, from day to night to get in, uh, input on this. And you can read all, all over the internet, this is happening right now. Well, it's quantum supremacy, it's not yet quantum advantage, it's not something which can be used yet. It's a purely academic problem, it is a, an artificial problem which Google chose just to show this. It cannot be used for many practical purposes. But it shows us that these machines are not just science fiction. And that when, you know, the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, they said, I think it was Schrodinger saying, the idea of manipulating an individual quantum, an individual atom in a lab is more ridiculous than thinking to raise a pterodactyl in a zoo, they were wrong. And there are many things coming out of this, and quantum computing is just one of them. Another one is quantum simulation. Now, Simulating means understanding how some system, you know, like you, you put a car in a wind tunnel. You put a model of the car in the wind tunnel so that you can study, you know, on this model, it simulates what will be the behavior of a real big car. It's much cheaper to do that. You can try different possibilities and then it will tell you something which is useful when you want to realize a real car. So how can you do this when you have very small objects? You have, for instance, molecules or, you know, molecular structures for new materials. Well, those are quantum objects. So, calculating those properties with a normal computer, it's impossible. It's too difficult. But now, if I take those single atoms and I put them together in a structure which is similar to the structure of that material or that molecule, 
could be some new drug, could be high temperature superconductivity, then I am able to control my quantum simulator and to get information on the properties of the real thing. I could get, in principle, information on the properties on the uh, action of a certain chemical, for instance, for drugs or fertilizers, before I test it on animals or people. That's, of course, very long term. So, as I said before, now we have this demonstration. It is, you know, almost essentially practically useless. For useful things, we need to make it much bigger. But already, in quantum simulation, there are already some first steps in which you really see here, so this is a picture which is very dear to me because I showed it to a couple of vice presidents of the European Commission. It is, it is taken with copy and paste function from a nature paper from my colleague Emmanuel Bloch in, in Munich. You know, here is a black curve, and the black curve is the supercomputer, the most powerful in Europe at the time, seven years ago in Ulich, computing some property of some quantum material. And then, at some point, the black line stops because the computing power is over. Okay, but then the quantum simulator goes on top of it. It is made with individual atoms, as you can see here, in a regular structure, which mimic the property of some magnetic material, and then the quantum simulator goes on calculating for a little bit more. So these machines exist, can be realized, and can bring us some very important applications. Now this is for computing and simulation, but there are a couple other examples. One is about measuring things. So now, forget the single atom, and that imagine a single electron. A single electron is the tiniest magnet that you can possibly imagine. So, a very tiny magnetic field comes, and the electron goes <gasps> Because, I mean, it is very sensitive. So you can use it for sensing. And actually, in Stuttgart here, there are some of the worldwide protagonists on this, on this field, like my colleague Jörg Rachtrup. And, um, what can you do there? You use the single electron, you have a nearby a neuron, and this neuron fires, okay? Goes on or off, and the electron can measure this in real time on a single neuron level. So this again seems science fiction, but there is a company also nearby, which is called Bosch, and they have a project, a pilot project in the Federal National Program uh, in Germany for Quantum Technologies, in which they are trying to create a helmet which you will, uh, um, you will equip with those little sensors in order to read in real time some brain activity and to go towards a human-machine interface. And there are other aspects of using those individual quantum systems for sensing. For instance, you can create a, an ultra-precise clock which measures time very exactly. And why is it relevant for everybody? Well, in your car, you have a little box which talks to a satellite. The satellite goes boop, boop, boop. Then there is another satellite which goes boop, boop, boop. And then your uh, box, your navigator, can tell you where you are, but only within a few meters, because there is only so much precision in this time measurement from satellites. Now, if you use this entanglement, this very delicate quantum states that I described before, you can bring this precision 100 or maybe 1,000 times more, so your car will know whether it is here, or maybe here, or maybe here. So it means that, for instance, for autonomous navigation, this can have really a very large impact. And there are a lot of different other um, applications of this using, again, individual quantum systems, in this case, for measuring something. Now, before my time goes to an end, I want to show you that you can use this also for secure communications, because now, if instead of atom or electron, I use a single photon. A photon is a quantum. You cannot cut it in half. So if I send you my message via single photons, and then, let's say, some, uh, I don't know, the National Security Agency from the US comes and wants to get the uh, information, they cannot just get half of the photon. Nowadays, I send you per bit, uh, you know, many hundreds of photons, they take a couple, they can just read our communication. We all know that. But now, if it is with single photons, it doesn't work. Because if you don't get my photon, then we know that someone is, is listening. And we can do it again. So this gives us secure communications. And you know, unlike the other things which are not yet commercials that I described, this is, these are pictures of actually devices which you can purchase. And not only you can use them on Earth, but also you can use them on a satellite. This is a picture from a Chinese satellite, which is really realizing this kind of experiment, including teleportation. 
Now, I do not have the time to tell you about teleportation, so maybe for the next TEDx talk, it will be, you will have to attend that. But what I want to tell you in the last few minutes that I have is actually what we are doing, because this is coming, as I said, from the lab, from many labs, even around us, even in this building. And, well, actually, we are trying to build a European undertaking which takes all these components and brings them to society. For having, you know, secure communications, for having much stronger computing power, as Google has just showed, to get uh, sensors with much, much higher resolution. And, of course, to keep the lab dimension very strong, because without basic science, this is not going to be able to be performed in the future. So lab and app necessarily go together. And where does it bring us? Where does it lead for society, for instance, to a quantum communication infrastructure that we are starting to set up? A dozen countries, including Germany, uh, have signed already a first agreement to do this, to deploy across all of Europe, those secure quantum communication channels, so that data, for instance, you know, your sensitive data for uh, you know, banking, finance, health, can be protected in a completely secure way. And this should be really a backbone which can then lead to, in the future, the quantum internet in which we combine all these technologies together to make them available to everybody. So the idea is that we can use though and combine those quantum technologies really to bring this benefit to each and every one of you, both on terrestrial level and on space level. And this is really something which could have a very strong impact. We already see the beginning of that. But this is, again, why I like very much the title that we have today. Because without a lab in which scientists ask useless questions, just because they like it, <laughs> we would have nothing of that. And this is really the right place to talk about this, because Max Planck Society is really for fundamental science in this country, and one of the important fundamental science research institutions in Europe. So thanks a lot, Max Planck. Thank you, Stuttgart.